Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world right now. It's time for the Whiskey Cast Happy Hour Live Show. It's five o'clock East Coast time on the uh, U.S. East Coast. I'm Mark Gillespie, and welcome. It's been a couple of weeks since we've done one of these. Uh, I was traveling in Ireland for the last couple of weeks, uh, last couple of Fridays, and could not uh, join you guys. But uh, I'm back now, and uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun over the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour or so. I'll be joined in just a second by James and Maura Doherty of Sleeve League Distillers. Um, I wanted to, I don't normally share product ideas with you or product things with you, but I found a flask that, from High Camp Flasks, that they sent me this, to be honest with you. But this may be my favorite flask because not only does the cop screw off like you would normally expect, but so does the bottom which makes it a lot easier to fill because you can fill it from the bottom with the top screwed on. And uh, I'm thinking if you're looking for something for a Christmas gift, look at High Camp flasks. It's expensive, but uh, you're not going to pour any whiskey down the side of the flask either. The cap snaps on magnetically. Um, it's about $99, but uh, I was impressed with it enough to uh, sort of share it with you because uh, Christmas is coming and people are looking for some good gift ideas. So let's uh, see who else is joining us right now. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Greg Bonsoir from Paris. Bill Ricker is joining us. Uh, Graham Frazier joining us from Loch Inver in the wild remote northwest of Scotland. Chris Ratcliffe has opened his first 1792 full proof this week. And Greg's Whiskey Guide says, yes, it is pricey, but uh, for a flask that you can actually open from the bottom, uh, it's something I've never seen before, and I like the idea of it. Uh, let's see, Dave Kuhn finally made it to Westland Distillery a couple of weeks ago. They were lovely. The woman in the taste room said she loved you, Whiskey Cast. She gave him a glass of Deacon's Seat. Oh, boy, that's a good one. That was one of their first releases back in the day. Uh, glad you got there, and uh, glad you've met a fellow listener along the way, Dave. Let's bring in our guests right now from the Sleeve League Distillery, County Donegal, Ireland, a beautiful northern part of Ireland. James and Maura Doherty. Good evening, folks. How are you tonight? Good evening, Mark. Yeah, it's great to be with you, Mark. We're all well. It's unseasonally mild, but it's still raining, so you'll be pleased to hear that. And uh, our pal William Lavelle from the Irish Whiskey Association is in Montreal Airport and watching from uh, oh, good man, William, watching yeah. tonight, your friend, because, uh, James, you're about to become the chairman at the beginning of the year of the Irish Whiskey Association. Give us your take on the state of Irish whiskey right now after the uh, global report the other day at the House of Commons and the European Parliament. Well, it's it's a it's a fantastically exciting time. I mean, you see the the bounce back after COVID, the categories kind of back in growth. Um, so you can so lots of positive things happening in that sense. You've, you're now at sort of a kind of consistent forty odd distilleries now running. Um, you, you, we're probably starting to move out of the the kind of wood based phase into the kind of distilleries own spirit phase, which will be really exciting. Some significant headwinds out there, though. It's, you know, you can't get away from the fact that energy prices are are kind of creeping up. Cost prices across the board, whether it's glass, spirit labels, you know, shipping. Um, uh, you know, so those are kind of big issues, and, and the sustainability agenda is kind of kicking on as well. So, you know, I think it's you know, sustainability is no longer something that you gave an afterthought to. I think, you know, a lot of the new distilleries, thankfully, are kind of being designed with it in and. Um, but it's it's very much a table stake, I think, for drinkers as well. You know, people are expecting you to do it. And I think it's important for us that we sit, you know, we sort of tread lightly on the ground where we are is, is kind of our philosophy as well. But, um, you know, it's, it's good to see the category back in growth and back in strong growth. Let's talk about your whiskeys, the Silky whiskeys. I'm drinking the Midnight Silky here, which was uh, finished in virgin oak and imperial stout casks. Tell us about this one, because we've got some questions about it already come in by email. Oh, lovely. So well, the, the, the Silky range is, is designed to take you on a journey through smoky Irish whiskey, a sort of return to the taste of rural Ireland, uh, if you like, and, and as opposed to the sort of more city-based flavors that probably have dominated Irish whiskey sort of since the 1960s. And the Silky, the Midnight Silky is our third in the, um, 
is it the third in the range it's the core the, they're the core releases the the midnight is a single malt the the legendary silky and the dark silky are both blends with with great with grain whiskey bases um with, with midnight silky 35 percent of the blend is, is triple distilled peated irish whiskey or smoky irish um the base structure of it, I guess, is made up of a, a Cabernet Sauvignon casks and the Imperial Stout casks you mentioned, which give you a real creaminess and a kind of nice red sort of toffee apple sweetness. Um, and then we have Oloroso sherry, uh, Oloroso sherry, and then the an Oloroso sherry finished in virgin oak, which gives you that kind of balances the sweetness with the bitterness. So it's quite a complex blend. It's um, theoretically, it's the, the smokiest of our range. I don't think it quite drinks that way. Um, and that's maybe because it's effectively a single malt rather than a blend. Where did the idea come from for this one? Connor O'Hare says he thinks the Imperial cask finish is amazing. The peat and the roasty notes of the beer are perfectly balanced. And uh, he also wants to know if you'll see a cask strength version coming out at any point. <laughs> yes. There is one. There was one released um the end of September. September yeah. yeah. So, so cost strength came out at the end of September. So that is available uh, only here in Ireland at the moment. Um, and it's sort of at the distillery or on the online shop. Um, we'll try to roll out cost strengths, you know, more frequently now. It's just we haven't really had the kind of distribution platform that, that, that could cope with those things. It was probably a little bit early for us in terms of our sort of brand evolution, the kind of growth of the business, if you like. The, the Imperial Stout Busks, um, it's from White Hag Brewery in Sligo are, are fantastic. I mean, I thought they would give us a real kind of milk chocolatey note. I think it comes across as a more creaminess, um, and it, but it does give you this lovely, we love this kind of idea of a soft mouthfeel, a soft texture to the whiskey, no matter how strong they are. Um, and we bottle everything kind of not at 46%, so they're non-chill filtered, all natural color. Um, but does, as, uh, as Connor picked up, those the Imperial Stout cast really does set off the peated elements really nicely. And the Midnight is beautiful at cask strength. Really, really nice, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Our pal Greg Serafian in Paris says he doesn't know the distillery. He's only heard of the Silky name. He wants to know if you source your whiskeys or if you have your own whiskey ready already. I know you're laying down your own whiskeys, but this is sourced, yeah. correct? It is. This, these are um, so Great Northern is a distillery where we source our whiskies from. We have used Cooley previously, um, but uh, all of the whiskies in the Silky currently are all from Great Northern and um, were blended originally um, with Brian Watts. You know, I spent a lot of time at Will Grants and learned to blend at uh, the knee of David Stewart, and and then have taken that on to work with Brian, bless him, who helped us put the Silkies together and create that style that it is today. So. The silky is sourced and will largely always be sourced. Um, not the distillery, our distillery in Adra only produces peated whiskey, so peated single malt and peat pot still. So we we will never produce a you know we haven't got any columns, so we can't produce a grain whiskey, and we don't produce any unpeated whiskies in the distillery. So we'll continue to source those elements. Um, so yeah, I suppose it, it'll continue to be a largely sourced blend. Uh, and, and I kind of we say it on the neck label, so for us, it's always important that you're kind of transparent about that. We are getting a couple of questions in about Brexit. Uh, Chris Ratcliffe wants to know what effect Brexit has had on distributing whiskies around Ireland, since you have the uh, the question of the Northern Irish border to deal with. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one. Brexit for us has probably been more of a challenge for inputs, so stuff coming into into us rather than distributing around Ireland. Northern Ireland technically, so the island of Ireland is technically still all within Europe. So the, the so that part of it means that distribution from the Republic into the north is not really, a, um, that challenge hasn't really changed. But um, going across to, to, the, to the British mainland, we, the UK has moved from being an EU partner where everything could move, there was a free movement of goods and services to a third country. So the paperwork now is effectively the same as we'd have to do to ship to the USA or, or to South Africa or Australia or anywhere else. So the paperwork burden is bigger. And also, you've got to remember that you know, for sort of 40 years, all of the customs officials haven't had to deal with this kind of stuff. Too. So everyone's on a really steep learning curve. Um, from, that's from an export perspective. And then from an import perspective, everything that used to come through the UK, we try now to route direct from Europe you know, on ferries that come direct into Ireland because the land bridge 
is just not as efficient as it used to be because you know if a lorry's got 20 pallets on it and one thing goes wrong then the whole lorry gets held up so you know lorry drivers are unwilling to come across from europe through the uk and are you know forced are forced to kind of find other routes or like our gas bottle purchases now we have to buy full lorry loads because the lorry drivers don't want to bring broken loads across so we bring we get full lorry loads from poland that come all the way around on a ferry from northern france into dublin so some of it's a, it's frustrating it's added lead time but not a great of cost just a lot of frustration is it a case of uh, having to stockpile stuff ahead of time so that you know that you've got it on hand or is it a case of uh, still hoping it arrives just in time no. We have to stockpile stuff, definitely. We bought botanicals for our gin just at the beginning when Brexit first happened, and they were stuck in Dublin for six months. So yeah. we had to go on the rob to Drum Shambo and other places to try and find botanicals so we could keep this thing. The rob? Yeah. <laughs> so it is tricky. It has, it has been... Yeah, so we, a problem for us. Yeah, so we we and, and that has a cash implication on on our startup. You know, you're you're holding great stocks of things that you wouldn't. You know, we certainly didn't plan to hold either bottles or botanicals or cardboard or anything in the sort of quantities that we now hold them in. But I think that's you you can't go out of stock. It's as simple as that. So you know, we those kind of things. If if we go if we go out of stock with our with our customers, that's a big a big no no. So we've we've just had to take that on the chin, unfortunately. Give us the origin story of uh, Ardra Distillery and Sleeve League Distillers. Well, you can tell my accent that I wasn't born in Donegal. So my, my parents, um, are left, or my mum particularly, left in, 19, in the mid-1960s to look for opportunity in, um, in London. So the, if you look at the, so Donegal, as a, in southwest Donegal, particularly where we live now, it, it's, a, it's an area that's been structurally disadvantaged for years. It, you know, it's an agriculture area. It doesn't have massive industry. So, and apart from fishing, sort of huge, it doesn't have significant employment. And the kind of weaving industry is not the big employer that it once was. So people left. And, and I've been in the industry for, you know, 20 odd years and probably 20 kilos, if I'm honest. But um, we came back with this notion that we could create opportunity for um, for the whole of the area by by sort of reclaiming the distilling heritage of Donegal, taking kind of trying to be true to the way that my two grandfathers, both illicit distillers, would have been on the hills and try to honor that process and bring back spirits that would be true to this area in um, in, a, in as authentic a way as we can be. So the distillery in Ardra is is built on the basis of uh, an illicit distilling process being executed in a very modern kind of context using modern tools, modern machinery and, and things like that. And and smoky Irish whiskey was definitely the style of the whole of Ulster. So the whole of the northern part of Ireland would have been that way. Um, and, and so we try and do things that celebrate Donegal, its people, its language, its place. We try and make sure that we make things that are beautiful, that drink soft and and have a sort of slightly contrary view of the world, which is what I would argue Donegal brings to the world. So that piece of it comes alive in smoky Irish whiskies, soft, rich, smoky Irish whiskies, and sweet, and so, you know, the gin world has gone very sweet and frivolous, and, and Moira, who has a particularly deft touch when it comes to gin distillation, has created a gin that is rich, complex, and savory. So it's kind of things that could only be made here. That's the whole idea. The distillery is about three and a half thousand barrels, 500,000 liters of pure alcohol. Um, so kind of on the bigger end of craft, I guess, in Ireland. Um, and it's funded, we started the funding, but largely funded by drinks, people that I would have met over the years who have backed us and backed us significantly. And we've had two successful crowdfunding rounds. We have probably 1500 shareholders. Um, isn't, is that about right now? Yeah. including craft keep, including yeah. the craft keep shareholders so that's um so it's kind of a very much a community-based piece and and hopefully that will kind of see us into the into the future with all the distilleries that have been sold recently and are up for sale now that we know about around ireland one of the things that impressed me most was that you two have managed to hang on to majority control of sleeve league how important was that to you it's very important um but we're very fortunate that um, the other founder director with us, James Keith, 
he um, he's worked on startup businesses and and he knew exactly how to go about things to make sure that we always stay in control, which is is always been the aim. We we haven't built the distillery to necessarily sell on. We've built it as a generational, as a thing. generational yeah. thing. So it's important for us to still be majority shareholders. I think it's important um, in in my head anyway, Mark. It's, it's really important that 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 you have kind of a singular vision that drives the business and and. You know, we we kind of see the distillery as a as just the end of the beginning, really. And you know, we've got the distillery built, and it is about building an international spirits business that will ultimately create a lot of employment. The the piece about you know, we were very lucky that the original shareholders that came in, the, who are all sort of drinks industry people, you know, we're very fortunate that uh, Dom De Lorenzo, John Davidson, both ex Sab Miller main board, um, they brought with them a number of other guys who are also sort of you know big drinks industry, you know, heavyweights who, who understand the length of time it takes to do this. And and they really came in and said, we love we love the idea, we love your vision, and we just we want to help you deliver it rather than let's see how we can turn this into something quickly within five years. So everyone has kind of signed up for that 10, 15 year play, which is realistically what it oh there it is. <laughs> and uh, uh, what the distillery a distillery really is. And and as Moira said, James Keith uh, who founded the business with us has been extraordinarily diligent and clever about curating. We've been able to create value along the way that's meant that we've stayed in as, as the majority owners of the business. Um, and we'll always be grateful for that. But, I, I want to show this uh, still. This is an <laughs> offset still that is your main wash still. Tell us about this one because if people will look at it and say, wait a second, that looks like a golf club. The neck is... Uh, <laughs> The still neck is off to the one side. Explain how this worked out. So, yeah, so the, the wash still, uh, actually called James after my dad. It's, kind of, it's got a big round belly and it does the heavy lifting. So just like my old man would. Um, it, it, the design idea is a nod to history. So we understand that sort of stills in the sort of 1900s got very big in Ireland and they had a central shaft when they were being direct fired that was driving a rummager that stopped anything sticking to the bottom and burning to the bottom. Um, and so we wanted to honor that, but also kind of create the sort of ex, the, the sort of reflux that that offset neck helps us to create. I think Tullam or Dew are the only other people who have uh, an offset neck on, in, on their stills. And so they're, they're a nod to history. I had this notion about it. I mean, you, 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 you'll, you've seen it, Mark, so you kind of know that some of this stuff is kind of just intuitive on, on our part. And we, we, we met Richard for Scythe Senior explained what we were trying to do with this sort of grains in process and and the still and and we drew it over dinner on a napkin uh in in kind of just like you'd see in a movie i guess but and and richard uh, senior just said i love it i'd love to make that for you and we said well that's fantastic it, you know, there's a lot of challenges then to get it made but it is it, i mean i think it's a thing of beauty it really is but it um it's got an external reboiler on it because we have got this grains in process so the grain is still in the distillery it's still in the stills sorry in the first wash still so um it gives you some real challenges which i think the u.s distillers would understand and in fact balconas have the same uh heating process i think on their wash still and and they were super super supportive to us in terms of helping us understand how they make it work and make it work really well so um you know kudos to the guys at the sites they've really made something that is beautiful and makes beautiful whiskey so we're, we're really chuffed with it i hadn't thought of it looking like a golf club i have to say it's a swan i thought maybe but <laughs> dave kuhn is looking at your website he wants to know what sleeve league means and we should explain that it's a geographical feature near the distillery right it is so the so sleeve league was is the site where we had a, we were originally wanting to build a distillery and that um sadly didn't happen but uh the so schlieve in irish and um, so the irish language has fewer uh letters in the alphabet than, than say a, a uk or british sort of english alphabet so bh makes a v sound and and mh makes a w sound very largely so schlieve is the first word Bieg is the, the second word schlieve is mountain and leak is uh flagstone so it means the mountain of flagstones and um yeah it's the it's the 
among the highest sea facing cliffs in Europe, half the mountain has fallen, one. has fallen into the sea at about six, and there are 600 meters high. So that's sort of three times height of the cliffs of Moha. Um, and you can, you can actually basically drive right up to the top of them. So it, it's, um, it's a beautiful, beautiful spot, but it's kind of battered by the wild Atlantic. There they are. So, um, and to get to the top, there is a path, which is called the one man's path, unsurprisingly, but it's, it's literally 15, 18 inches wide, Mark, and you, you drop 600 meters down one side and you drop three, four, 300 and something meters on the other side. So it's not for the faint hearted. I was told before I left to walk that trail very carefully because there wasn't enough insurance on me if I fell down <laughs> either side. <laughs> well, there you go. It's um, a bit too wet and windy the day we went up there. I wouldn't. Yeah. yeah. And thank you again for there. taking me up there that day. It was uh, just an absolutely stunning experience. Oh, and Dave also wants to know how full your cask ownership program is because only 600 casks for sale. It doesn't seem like a lot. We've got some more for sale if he's interested. <laughs> so there's, the, we basically launched it um, when the distillery opened, you know, when we started producing. We, we had a few early birds that came in, but really the sort of opening of the distillery is the kind of catalyst for the start. So we've got about 100 casks um, gone now. So there's a, there's a few, um, there's still a few to have. And, and as, as you know, the, it's a fundamentally important part of the financing of a distillery is really important. But our program is called Shanaki, which is a storyteller. You know, the, the original kind of legend keepers of the area were, would have been called Shanakis. And, you know, we would argue that if you own the barrel, you're part of the history of the, the oral history of the distillery. And, and your story is as much part of it as ours is. Um, but there's plenty of space. Um, happy to take a call on that for sure. <laughs> Dave says it's also nice that you have all the cask numbers and costs laid out in the brochure. Uh, that first number is always deceiving for interested peons like Dave, as he puts it. We, we try and be very um, transparent with everything we do. Um, it's very important to James in particular. So, um, yeah, what you see there is right. There's nothing hidden. And you don't really want to get buyer's remorse. So, you know, it's, it's pretty simple with us that you... It's six thousand euros that gets you the cask. We'll bottle it, and it's in, in Ireland. I think it's a. It basically comes to fourteen grand all in when you've got all of the taxes, duties, VATs, and bottling, and all the rest of it. I think it works out slightly cheaper if you sent it to the US. But um, but if you at the end of five years, if you don't want it, we'll buy it back off you. Or if you don't want, if you want some of it, we'll buy the rest back off you. So it's kind of we try to de-risk it as much as possible because we I, pay you interest as well. So. Yeah, three percent a year. But I think the the reality of all of these things is that um, it's you know it, it's a thing about trust, and it's important for us. Um, uh, you know, the, the the I don't want someone to regret doing it. We want them to come with the come with us on the journey. It's an amazing. It's hard work, but it's a, it's been an amazingly kind of rewarding. Um, journey so far, and and we'd love people to kind of enjoy it with us. So. Uh, so the duty on the yield, yeah, that's right. So, um, Ian Bruce wants to know if the casks are matured on site, and if so, will the location result in a sea infused spirit? Uh, you're not that far from the ocean, but uh, just far enough, right? Yeah, so we're about uh, the, 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 the I mean, the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean is about 150 meters from the distillery, so it's not like an island distillery where you see the white wall against the, the ocean, it's not like that, but it, it's um, but we're certainly in a maritime climate, it'll be humid we get we don't get particularly cold winters and we don't get particularly hold, uh, hot summers so um you probably get kind of an, an a long maturation season because you're not getting that kind of excessive cold period where maybe maybe the casks aren't breathing as much in the winter so it's it's i mean we're, we're convinced that that maritime environment is important and that's why we made sure that with the planning permission for the distillery we, we built the warehouses at the same time Tell us about the Solera method that you're using for your new make spirit, because uh, we mentioned this on Behind the Label in the last episode of Whiskey Cast, and uh, a lot of folks are familiar with Solera style yes. from maturation and finishing, but not from new make standpoint. How does this work? So um, it's, a, it's a good question. We, it's about the, the, the idea behind it was that the, that the beauty of the Solera is, is that it allows you to 
to bring different things together. If you're doing it at the end of a process, you're bringing different woods together, different ages together, and it allows you to keep that kind of consistency and continuity of style um, forever. So we we kind of wanted to cr convey the idea of legacy and the idea of that we would, and, and we felt that the Solera at the beginning of the process was an interesting way of doing that. So we have six, two 6,000 litre wooden Soleras. Um, the new make spirit is pumped up from the distillery to the barrel store and it goes into the wooden Solera. It's held at 78%, so the, the sort of still strength um, uh, in the wooden Soleras. And those Soleras are never fully emptied. So we basically can take six batches at a time in and they, they kind of mix together and we then try and iron, effectively we should be able to iron out the sort of inconsistency batch to batch. So we should always have a very consistent spirit going forward. And we don't have the luxury of um, you have 200 years of history to sell, but in 100 years time, hopefully someone will be able to come in and some of that original spirit will still be in those it's Soleras nice. because it's yeah. because okay. the um, because the off takes um, a quarter of the way up. So it's always a quarter of the tank is still um, is still full. So it, it gives us continuity batch to batch. It allows us to kind of keep that connection to the original spirit and you know and for us it is about trying to convey sort of a sense of legacy which we've inherited from uh you know our grandfathers and fathers and, and mothers and, and want to kind of bequeath to the ones that come after us tell us about the poaching you made today using your grandfather's <laughs> recipe <laughs> yeah so we've had a bit of fun uh today i think you just missed it unfortunately but we, we've um so I, so this kind of, I suppose some of this idea really started with my gran and my granddad died in 78 and, and, and we never really heard tell of his potching stories when we were little um, and my gran would never have any conversation about it in the house. But when I was a student and I was studying agriculture, I hitchhiked over to see my gran and um, I sat with her one night and she just off the bat started telling me granddad's story and the story of his potching and she he, he does have 72 cousins and he was the only one who was told the story out of all of them so um that's so, kind of important to the story yeah so um so gran gave me the you know, she told me about it and she told me how she you know people who had tried to shop granddad to the police that she wouldn't you know she hadn't spoken to them since kind of thing and um and she made me write down his recipe which i've you know which we've carried around the world as we've lived in you know all sorts of different parts of the world I never quite understood why she gave it to me because I was going to be a farmer at that time. Um, but maybe she knew something I didn't. And we've just this week made his pochine recipe. It, it's I don't think it'll set the world alight, but it's a lot of fun. And the the recipe is peated malt, um, um, molasses, and uh, uh, and oats. So peated oats as well. So it's. Um, it's incredible. I mean, distilling it has been, I mean, listen, smelling it in the fermenters was amazing, but it is, it's got this lovely grassy, smoky anise, aniseed, which has really surprised us and, and a kind of almost a hazelnut brittle kind of taste to it. So yeah, that probably hasn't been made since maybe the mid sixties, um, which is always kind of fun, you know, bringing something like that back. What are you going to do with it? So we, we, we're going, we will sell it. Um, ultimately it's a, you know, we've, we've, got the the branding and everything is sorted um it'll be Carr's potching granddad was frank frank Carr, so you know and it's his recipe so so we'll honor him with it and but i'm i'm not sure at the moment how much time and energy we can give that uh can give it as a focus i think you know the the important thing for us is is getting the getting the distillery running really well make, laying down the best single more the best pot still that we can um getting this sort of creating the, some more silkies that kind of tell that smoky story and pave the way for the Ardra distillery whiskies when they come out. Um, so it is really an Irish whiskey play and, and Moira is working on some of her gins as well. So I think we've, we've got a lot on and it's probably Potchin's probably the harder one to sort of decide on, on, on how to bring to market. So it'd probably be a distillery exclusive at the start. I think. And we had a question uh, from Connor O'Hare. Can you get a tour around the distillery? And is there a gift shop? And the answer is to yes to both, right? Yes, yes to both. Yeah. Yes to both. Yeah. yeah. And it is, and it's very much a tour of a working distillery. Yes. It's not um it's not a full on visitor experience. You know, I, we, we we hesitate to use the word experience. So it, it you come and see us 
you, 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 I mean, you, you get up close and personal with all the equipment, the distillers are all moving around all the time. Um, the process that we use is kind of very distinct, quite specific, very Donegal. Um, it's the, I think it might be the only distillery that's completely configured the way it is. And we're dedicated to peated Irish, which is not a typical kind of thing. So, so it is kind of unique. Um, as, as you've seen, we've kind of shoehorned the shop and the tasting area into reception um, in, in the best <laughs> the best ways of a, of a startup, really. So, you know, there's a we'll over time, we'll enhance it and, and make it more. But it's it's open uh, Monday to Saturday, 10, 12, 2 and 4. Um, and, and Grania and Kyla will look after you. And Dave Kuhn wants to know about, wants to talk about your decision to make peated whiskey. Explain the legacy of uh, peated smoky whiskeys in the northern part of Ireland. Thank, I mean, it's a really good question because, you know, when you sort of, the sort of modern history of Irish whiskey is, is not not to sort of talk about smoky, smoky whiskeys. And we tend to talk about smoky. We, in Ireland, you don't really talk about peat so much as turf. So we would call it turf. And um, I mean, ultimately, the... <laughs> The northern part of Ireland made malt, I think was a single malt heartland and pot still was more a, sort of from the, the southern half of the country of the country. Um, and to us, it was kind of alien that any whiskies that would have been made in the area would have been dried without using sort of peat smoke as a as the, as the sort of way to fuel that fire to dry to, to get the create the hot air. And and there is kind of lots of evidence of kind of peated whiskies being made in, in Ulster. The Ulster style was, you know, probably, you know, a mix of double and triple distilled, but peated uh, single malts. And no one was really championing it. So when we came back to, to sort of build the distillery, we were very clear in our minds that it was Irish spellings kind of championing the Irish language because we live in the Gaeltacht, um, being true to our sense of place, you know, where we live, all of the whiskies here must have been peated. And if you look at the the reason that Burt Distillery, the last distillery in the area in 1841, when that closed, it was making a light kind of unpeated spirit and it just didn't have a home market and it wasn't big enough to compete on an international market. So it folded. And that said to us that, you know, we sh that was where we should focus because Donegal as a place is quite different to a lot of the rest of Ireland. It has this slightly contrarian view of the world, which I've definitely inherited. I think Moira would guarantee. Um, and, you know, the, the so we wanted to bring that style back. And, and we knew that my grandfather's potching recipe was peated. So it felt like that was the way we should be going and making a very distinct, very Donegal play in the world of Irish whiskey. Juan Cruz uh, apologizes if this was discussed. No, it wasn't, Juan, which is why we'll bring it up now. Is barley grown in Donegal? And if so, do you use local barley? And is the peat local as well? Or the turf? Yeah. No, so it's a, that's a really good question. And, and the answer is, is kind of some of it is part. So I'm just going to, is that the barley um, currently in the Silkies is, um, is sourced from Great Northern. So they're in control of that. For our own distillery, for the single malt, it's currently coming from Scotland. Um, uh, but for our pot still, the unpeated elements, the raw barley, is all coming from Donegal. Interestingly, sort of West Donegal, where we are, doesn't have the soils to grow significant, you know, doesn't have the soils to grow proper barley in a kind of significant way. But East Donegal has fantastic areas. So up near the Burt Distillery, up, uh, up into Inishowen and across Inch Island. Um, but those farmers for years were told that they couldn't grow distilling barley, that they could only grow feed barley. And so up until sort of four or five years ago, that's what they followed was that they were only making, only growing um, feed barley and it was going off for, for cattle feed and what have you. Whereas now they've, they can produce distilling barley. We're working with guys up there um, to, to, to grow for us. And we're working with some of the maltsters to take that Donegal barley across to to the maltsters in Scotland at the moment because there isn't maltsters on island on the island who can do what we need um, and send our turf with it and then it will come back to uh, it'll come back to us Peter at the moment we can't do it but it's we're working towards it and, and ultimately that is what we'll do what does having a distillery mean for a town like Ardra it was so Ardra is a, is a I mean it's a fantastic little festival town. It's a, it's a community that does hospitality very well. It's a pretty little town that has 
We've got the matchmaking um, Actually, yeah, so this a matchmaking so if you're looking for a, a husband or a wife, you should be in our guard this weekend. <laughs> but it, it runs festivals throughout the year to bring people together, to bring people into the area. It, it, it does hospitality superbly well. So it has, it's, it's a bit like a dingle in terms of it's well equipped with pubs. It's got some historic venues. Um, it has some hotels. It has some great uh, restaurants and what have you. So it's a real hospitality town. And it's all built on um, a historic industry of weaving and knitting and craft. So the, it's on the Wild Atlantic Way, which is probably the best tourism model that's been developed over the last 10 years. You know, when you think about what the Wild Atlantic Way has done for, for the sort of west coast of Ireland, it's absolutely incredible. And the distillery is right on it. What the trouble, I suppose, for, for a, a, just a town in southwest Donegal is the season is very short. If, you, if your season is based on the summer when it's amazing, um once you get past once you, you get past september through to april end of april it they you know there's no tourists around and what have you and the, the beauty of a distillery is it's, it's a year-round thing people come and see them all year round the they're not weather dependent and and you know lord knows the weather in Donegal is not something you come for a lot of the time so you know you need to be prepared uh, and you know i think the phrase there's no such thing as bad weather just bad clothes is was definitely designed in Donegal. Um, so the distillery is, from that perspective, is a way of keeping people in the area. And we've designed our, philo our philosophy is that we don't, we don't do hospitality. So we're not, it's a tour of a working distillery, a tasting through the gift shop and then back into the town. So we don't do tea, coffee, sandwiches. Why would we do it? You know, the town is, does it so well. You wouldn't, you know, why would we compete with that? And so we, we have this idea of maybe that we complete the offering of, of our draw rather than competing with the offering and so we become integrated into that ecosystem um of kind of tourism and hospitality but we're just one asset to it we're not we're not the biggest or the most important or anything and that's um and ultimately we will even remove the car park that's on the distillery at the moment and there'll be a bridge across from the village a footbridge so you'll park in the village car park and then you walk across to us so hopefully that as a as a model will be a, a kind of an interesting model for people to see which shows how distilleries can just be there to contribute and make bigger rather than take away or kind of hoover up all of the revenue tell me how you're going to define success 10 years from now gosh that's, that's, you can answer that's, that that's, one. <laughs> that's a big question um yeah well i suppose that um well, I suppose fundamentally we've got we've got a number of shareholders that that, that are looking for returns, and that's got to happen. So, so we ha we'll have to find an exit for some people. I mean, my view would be that we have an international spirits business with multiple brands uh, operating in multiple countries, and that we you know that we probably have a hundred thousand case business is really what we would be targeting. I think that's a self sustaining kind of size. We'd be present. We're already in 40 countries, and to be honest, that's big enough. It's complex enough for us. Um, we just need to grow those businesses well now and, and focus on the few key markets that really drive the business forward. Um, but success for me would be that peated Irish whiskey, is, a smoky Irish whiskey, is recognized as, as an authentic piece of the Irish whiskey sort of furniture and the fabric, and that would be really important. That And that Donegal has is recognized for having a distinctive style of spirit um, that that is of value to the sort of Irish spirits world. We had a discussion earlier about duties and customs, and uh, this is not something that uh, you guys can explain, but I want to go ahead and answer it real quickly here. Um, yeah. Because some folks were questioning about uh, what they can get away with with uh, passing through U.S. Customs with some bottles. Here's what I've been told, is that basically, unless your duty amounts to more than $20, it's actually more expensive for Customs to do the paperwork than it is to uh, to collect the duty okay. than it is for you just to let you, let you walk through. So um, the one time that I even got close that I had to pay duty was coming back from Speyside in 2010 when I had 18 bottles in my luggage and the duty was only $24. <laughs> so they made me pay it. But uh, other than that, uh, as long as you're honest and declare everything that you've got, they'll generally let you walk through. Um, I think I had 
five bottles of my luggage when I came back from uh, Ireland last Friday night and just told the uh, customs officer, that's what I've got. I'm a little over my limit. And he goes, have a nice night. As long as you're yeah. honest about it, they'll let you go through. I, so I I would say, sort of yeah, we would we'd be very similar. I can't take samples over all the time. Mark, and I would say, you know, I've, I've had five or six bottles in a, in my suitcase. Uh, I never, you know, never take anything into your check luggage, but sorry, in your carry on, but in your check luggage, five or six bottles. Like you say, if you're honest about it, I've never had anyone charge me, ask me, give me any hassle at all. Now, Dave Kuhn has a question. Has an Irish whiskey been made with roasted barley? Uh, yeah, no, I, not by us. Uh, I think I think um, David Boyd Armstrong at the Radaman Estate, which is Short Cross, I think he has done it. I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't know, but I would not be surprised if Peter Mulryan has done it down at Blackwater. Um, so it's the kind of thing that Peter would have definitely had a look at. Um, and probably Ecklandville and Killowen, I would have suspect, might have looked at. And Bueliok, the small distillery at the north of Donegal. So I would say, yes, it's been done. I'm pretty sure David's done it down at Radaman, but I'm not sure of any that, that have made it to market yet. And let's see here. Chris Tansenko says, who lives in Australia, says they don't even ask about it anymore on the immigration paperwork for U.S. Customs. Uh, unlike Australian Customs, where they get excited if you're over 2.1 <laughs> liters, that's because the taxes are much higher in Australia, right? Absolutely. I would assume so, Chris. So, yeah. so that should pretty much do it. I really appreciate your time tonight, James and Mara Doherty from Sleeve League Distillers. Thank you for joining us uh, I know it's late over there, and I appreciate you staying up late to uh, join us. No, it's an absolute You're pleasure. Welcome. And thank you for coming to see us the other day. Much really yeah. appreciated. Come thank you for hosting you. me. I appreciate it. Uh, wait, wait a second. I forgot. We had, didn't talk to you more about the gin. <laughs> You're all right. <laughs> but you did, you did like the gin, which made I me I did very, like very the gin, and I'm not a gin you. person. Yeah, that made me very happy. So tell us about uh, making gin. Well... We make Andulaman, which is um, a gin of the sea, a gin to make you feel like you're being kissed by a sea breeze. It contains 11 botanicals, and five of those are seaweeds, which we harvest locally on the shores around where we are. In fact, tomorrow Jim's got to go out and try and find some pepper gulfs because we can't make any more gin until we've got some. So um, that's our gin. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the five, five seaweeds, most of them would have been used as a foodstuff yeah. or, you know, they've been eaten or snacked on for thousands of years. Sugar cow, which is a sweet kombu, I think actually Grey Whale actually in the US uses that one. I think it's probably the, the most straightforward of the, gin, of the yeah. seaweeds to use. Dulse, which is a snack here locally, is a bit like a vegan jerky and tastes um, a bit like smoky bacon crisps, uh, if that makes sense. Um, Carrageen moss, superfood, which uh, also foams incredibly. So yeah, we vapor infuse that. So one we vapor we? infuse that simultaneously. Um, you learned Dulemar. that the hard way, as I recall, didn't you? <laughs> we did. We put it into our still. It's the very first thing we ever tried to distill, and it foamed and came out of everywhere. It was a nightmare. So we were scrubbing the floors full on, full on and, and the walls and everything. It yeah. was foaming all over the place. Um, and then the final, the most special of the seaweeds is one called uh, pepper, pepper dulse, dulse, which is the one I'll be picking tomorrow. It's uh, the truffle of the sea. It it grows literally an inch long. Um, it's we need a low tide to follow it out, follow the tide out, and get chased back in. But it it tastes like garlic chorizo uh, with a sort of chili, leaves your lips tingling like chili. It's incredible stuff, um, but it's a nightmare to pick because you're on your hands and knees with almost nail scissors, kind of doing it. But I have to say, more is we came back to do this together, but it turns out she's just a much better distiller than me. <laughs> so it is a savory gin. Um, it's a bit different from other gins out there, but since 2017, we've been capturing the magic of the sea. That's what we're saying. It, it, it um, makes a, a really good martini, a good Negroni. Um, my favorite way to drink it is a mojito. 
And if you get fresh oysters and you, you eat the oyster out of the shell, but leave the liquor in the shell and put a shot of andulamin in and drink it, it's absolutely delicious. It's a perfect dirty martini. Perfect dirty martini, but um, it's not in America yet. We need to work on getting a bigger bottle and getting yeah. our registration done. But Henry's, Henry's keen for it. Yeah. So we, we're distributed by the Henry Price at Price Imports, you know, and Henry is a bit of a legend in the industry, I know, but he, he's also a curator of some amazing spirits down there in his stable. Um, and, you know, he's got, he's got our silkies into, uh, I think we're in 41 states already of the US, which is kind of going some. Um, but, uh, just one of the best people to work with. We've had such such a good time with him, and he's uh, um, you know kind of rolling it out. I think he has actually got agreements for for the silkies to be in fifty states, but we have sort of only launched into forty one at the moment. So you know it's kind of watch the space that you know these, the silkies pave that sm the way for that smoky Irish whiskey journey that will um, hopefully the the our dry whiskies will come down. Uh, and, and and hopefully this year we'll have Dulem on there as well. well. We're getting a lot of comments on the gin. People like the sound of what you're making there, Maura. Good. Very good. That makes me very happy. So I'll have, that? yeah, that's it. Yeah. I'm told the other one, Retha gin. Retha? Never I've never heard of that one. Retha. Never heard no. of that one either. No. no. There are quite a few gins that contain seaweed, but as far as we know, we're the only gin with five seaweeds in it. But, I mean, there may be one with more, I don't know, but not that we know about. Well, Dave Kuhn says he will buy a bottle of the Silky. <laughs> he just has to remember where he saw it on the shelf. <laughs> Good man. Well, thank and you with for that, yeah. we will call it a night. Thank you for joining us once again, James and Maura Doherty of uh, Sleeve League Distillers in the beautiful County Donegal in Ireland. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go, go. Uh, just go and enjoy it. It's a beautiful part of the world that... Uh, I would uh, go back and live there in a heartbeat if I could. Oh, you're a good Thank man. You. Well, you're welcome anytime. And, uh, the and bring Christine next time. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I don't think she's going to let me go without her again. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. We will put you guys uh, off to the side here. And uh, just wanted to tell you what's coming up on the show this weekend. We have Lagavulin's number one fan, Nick Offerman, joining us on the podcast this week. It'll be out Monday morning, first thing, depending on where you are in the world. But uh, he talks about everything from his uh, how he discovered Lagavulin to making all those fun commercials to his adventures with Ian MacArthur, the legendary pinky at Lagavulin. Uh, we even have a discussion of how to pronounce Lagavulin. And he says emphasis on the vu in Lagavulin. So we will have that interview for you. It was a fun chance to talk with Nick Offerman, and I think you're going to enjoy it. That'll do it for this week. We'll see you again next Friday night at 5 o'clock East Coast time. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Good night, all.